What it do, what it do, what it do, good people. Let me take that out. Let me, let me, let me cut that. That's the Sebastian Telfair interview that we're going to break down. But hold on, that's neither here or there right now. I'm here to talk to you about this Jason Whitlock, Stephen A. Smith. I know y'all like, damn, Taz, how you going to give us the, 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 the Sebastian Telfair and Stephon Marbury to Stephen A. Smith and Jason Whitlock? I get it. However, y'all going to have to check this out because I want to know y'all thoughts on it. Do, do y'all really think uh, Stephen A. is lying? Or Jason Whitlock just picking? I mean, I mean, come on, Cat Williams got everybody just saying, hey, hey it's, time to let it, it's time to let everything out. It's time to go. I ain't going to get too deep for y'all because y'all know we're in a quiet season. And all the bullshit will be revealed. Excuse my English. All right? Now, come to y'all live on Taz TV. I, and before I leave, hold on, one more time. Did y'all see that St. John's Providence game the other day? Hmm? Did y'all did y'all watch that game? When you had the great Kim Kim English, Baltimore stand up, head coach, go go toe to toe with with, with Patino. I mean St. John's won by one. It was a good game. St. John's Providence, you know, still sh salute and shout out to Kim because at the end of the day. <laughs> He went toe to toe with a with a with a, with a great an all time great coach, and besides that, Rick Pitino, man, he gonna do it again. Mark my word. I'm not gonna say a national championship in the next three years. I'm not gonna say that. But watch, just pay attention to Rick Pitino and how he work and how he recruit. Coming live from Ted's TV. Oh yeah. I got to tell you, being brought to y'all by Rising Star Clothing. You hear me? Rising Star Clothing. Go check him out. He on uh, on Instagram, on Facebook. Go cop something right now. When y'all buy something, Class. tell him Ted. He failed an assignment uh, and was removed from the team. That's according to his book. That, uh, just, just a guy fails an assignment and is removed from his high school basketball team. So after his abbreviated high school career, which involved him riding the bench for half the season, Smith matriculated to the Fashion Institute of Technology College of New York. It's a school for men and women that want to get into fashion. Smith enrolled so he could play on Fitz's junior college basketball team. He rode the bench at Fit too. In his book, oh, hold for a second. Not only did he ride the bench, he halfway through the season without, I don't even say halfway through the season, at some point during the season, without explanation in the book, he disappeared from the Fit basketball team. He just said, I left. He didn't explain why, other than saying he was riding the bench. But I want to read this to you. This is this is directly related to basketball. This is what he said his schedule was like while a member of the fit basketball team in New York City. I'm going to read to you from his book that unfortunately I've read. Off the court, I didn't have a minute to spare. Cultivating an endless capacity for work, I took the maximum 18 credit hours a semester. Why? Anyone who grew up poor knows the answer. When you're relying on financial aid, you take as many hours as possible because you don't know how long your education will be paid for. I also found a full-time job to offset the cost of books and expenses as well as any extracurricular activities I might pursue that my, my aid didn't cover. Oh, my mother had made it clear she wasn't supporting another do-nothing man in the house. So my job at Barnes & Noble's bookstore in Midtown Manhattan started every weekday morning at 8.30 a.m. So here's the schedule Stephen A. Smith says he was living under while playing basketball uh, for the fit team. Like many other Hollis commuters, that meant the following routine. Wake up at 6 a.m., shower, dress, and then hustle up the block to catch the Q2 bus on the Hollis Avenue. 25 minutes later, I jump off at Hillside Avenue and 139th Street to catch the F or E train for another 45-minute ride to Midtown near Rockefeller Center. From there, I walked a couple blocks to the job. Except for a half-hour lunch break, I was on my feet until 4 p.m., helping one customer after another. I then raced across town to fit. Just, I want you to zero in on this. And if you've never been to New York City, maybe you want to understand how crazy this sounds. Or if you've never lived in a major city, you want to say how crazy this sounds. I'm going to reread it. Except for a half hour lunch break, I was on my feet until 4 p.m., helping one customer after another. I then raced across town to fit from 48th Street and 5th Avenue to 28th Street and 8th Avenue to make the team's 4.30 p.m. practice. Anybody from New York, hop in the chat, hop in the comments, call me, email me. To, <clears throat> you go from 4 you're in New York City, and at 4 p.m. you get off from work. You go across town, and you're ready for a 4.30 p.m. basketball practice? Stephen A. Smith and I are the same age. We, we would have been athletes at the same time. I, he got held back a year, so he's a grade behind me, but we're the same age. And I played football in college. He's a legend. He played basketball in college. You can't go across town in New York in 30 minutes and be ready for basketball practice at 4.30, but it's his book, and maybe it's just a tiny exaggeration, but I'm if you read this book, because I'm not going to get to everything in this book, it's crazy. Then he says, after nearly two hours in the gym, it was another sprint to make my classes each weeknight from 6.30 to 9.20 p.m. After class, I retraced my morning route back to Hollis, walking through my mother's front door at 11.30 p.m. Whatever homework or studying I couldn't fit in during lunch or break or weekends, I did then. I'd eventually fall asleep, wake back up at 6, and do the same damn thing all over again. This is... <laughs> I'm when, I, when I first read this book, it was so farcical and so I was like, wait, what's going on here? Who, who, who authorized this? Who's writing this? Who thinks this is believable? But then I kept, I kept reading. 
scroll up. I, I want to scroll up a little bit because I've already covered what, what's there. Uh, oh, the next thing Smith alleges is that his sister's friend or boyfriend or somebody, this is after he mysteriously quits the fit basketball team. And by the way, I've talked to one of Stephen A. Smith's former high school teammates who graduated with Stephen A. Smith in 1986, uh, who told me, you know, Stephen A. Smith rode the bench in high school and talked his way onto the team and wasn't any good and, you know, was like six foot one, 140 pounds and uh, begged the coach to be on the team. And, and, and again, Stephen A. Smith says it only lasted a few months. He, got, he allegedly failed one class. Uh, but this guy played on the next year a competing junior college team that would have competed against this fit team. And he's like, Stephen A. wasn't there. And so Stephen A. would argue like, yeah, I quit the team. I don't tell you why, but I quit the team. And so Stephen A. then argues that he played a couple of, a month or two of high school basketball and never really played. He played a month or two of junior college basketball and never really played. And then somehow in February of 1988, a former Winston-Salem State basketball player puts him through a playground workout in New York City. A playground workout in New York City in February. Check your weather calendar. February, New York City. Stephen A., according to his book, is going through a playground tryout. He's going through a workout with some guy that played at Winston-Salem State years ago on an outdoor playground in New York City. He wants us to believe that. And the guy's so impressed, he says, oh my God, Stephen A., next weekend, this is according to the book, I'm going to come pick you up and drive you down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina for a tryout with Big House Games. I'm reading this and I'm going, holy cow, who is serving this up and who is believing it? And why? Why would someone tell these kind of lies? And, and, and <laughs> so he writes in the book, the next weekend, the guy comes and picks him up on a Saturday. They drive all day to North Carolina, check into a hotel. And on Sunday, wake up, and this is, a, I'm gonna read this, let me see if I can find this directly in the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they wake up on Sunday and show up at a Winston-Salem State basketball practice that was already going on, a scrimmage. So again, I'm going a little bit out of order here because I'm just, I'm just lost in the sauce right now. But, but just think this through, and because I went and looked, it's February. I go check Winston-Salem State's basketball schedule for the 87-88 season. When, you know, this is happening in February of 1988. This covers the 87-88 season. Winston-Salem State, like virtually every other college basketball team during that era, played a basketball game on every Saturday of February. So Stephen A is saying that Winston-Salem State, at the end of their basketball season, when they're preparing for their conference tournament, and, what, and maybe trying to qualify for the Division II postseason tournament, that they play a game on Saturday, he wakes up the next morning, they're having a scrimmage that he arrives to late in the middle of, and Big House Gaines checks this six foot one, 150 pound guard from New York City, who played a couple of months of high school basketball without acquiring any stats or anything, played a month or two of junior college basketball without acquiring any stats or anything. He shuts down the practice, checks Stephen A. Smith into the scrimmage, and then, according to Smith's account, he knocked down 17 straight shots in the scrimmage, and Big House Gaines offered him a full scholarship immediately after the practice. I, I'm reading this, and when I read it, I was like, you gotta be kidding me, this is a comic book, and this man's calling this his memoir. He got a full ride out of the ship after checking into a Sunday scrimmage after a team played a basketball game on Saturday, knocks down 17 straight shots, and the coach of this team, which if you go read Big House Gaines' memoir, his book, his biography, all Big House Gaines did was complain about how limited his budget was at Winston-Salem State, how the school wasn't flush with cash and a bunch of scholarships for his players. He was always trying to make ends meet. But this frail, frail kid from New York City, he gave a full scholarship to next year's team after watching him play for an hour in the scrimmage because he allegedly knocked down 17 straight shots. Who writes this? Who believes this? I cannot appropriately do justice to the far spread story Stephen A. Smith paints in Straight Shooter. Smith has struggled to explain it himself on TV. In November of 2022, not that long ago, November of 2022, what was that, 14 months ago, 15 months ago, on the set of NBA Countdown with Malika Andrews, David Rose, and J.J. Reddick, ESPN ran a graphic of Smith, Rose, and Reddick's uh, senior year stats. Oh, let's play this clip. I, wanna, I don't know, what, what is it? Yeah, slot number four. I, or no, yeah, slot number three. Number three. I want to play the clip of Stephen A. Smith, of Malika Andrews, and J.J. Reddick, and J.J. Rose. Here's Stephen A. Smith talking about his senior year. We're coming off college hoops, guys. Yeah. So I did want to show you all this. And I got a little time to show you here before we dig into the NBA. Take a look at this blind resume here. It's three players. They're scoring average in each person's final college season. Who do we guess this? Who this might be? What are you doing? Who do you think? What is this? No, this is hilarious. JJ's on the right. It's our starting lineup friend tonight. Well, they're not telling us. They're not telling us. They're only playing one game because of crap when he kept it happening. That's neither. That's not here. This man disappeared 48 hours ago. She never touched this case. Did y'all just look and hear what Stephen A. Smith just said on national TV? They put his senior year stats up. Everybody's giggling. You can tell. Stephen A's pretty uncomfortable early on. He ain't in on the joke or maybe no one warned him. I don't know, he tried to loosen up at the end. But then at the end he says, what they're not telling y'all is I only played one game because I cracked my knee. And then, so, look, look, I'm not good at math. That math is not my strength. I was a writer and, and you know, I struggle. I use both my hands and toes to count. But walk me through this and walk yourself through it. And I leave it alone. And one of the other things that I never do, I never attack my colleagues. I might disagree with something somebody says or does, and I might have an obligation to speak on it because it's in the news or whatever, but I don't speak against my colleagues. Once humanity comes into play, that's a given. Here's the other. That's not real work. Think about this for a second. I'm supposed to be covering sports, but I make a career out of talking about my colleagues. That ain't work. That's you finding some slick way to get a check because you can't get a job. That's Jason Whitlock. That's who the hell he is. Now, I have sat back for years, at least nine to 10 years, 
saying absolutely nothing about this man. I never uttered the words fat bastard out of my mouth until a few months ago. So that means that the previous nine years, you never heard me speak on him at all. But now it's necessary. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because you see, if you listen to the fat bastard, I didn't play high school ball. Even though my coach's name was Harvey Stoller, it was Thomas A. Edison Vocational and Technical High School. I played there my senior year. I was in a basketball tournament at Fashion Institute of Technology where I dropped 27 points and got a scholarship because the coach came calling me after that and what have you. If you listen to him, I never had a scholarship to Winston-Salem State, even though it's on the books. Just call the university. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm an honorary doctorate member. I have an honorary doctorate from Winston-Salem State University because of my contributions to Winston-Salem State. I'm called Dr. Smith. Has something to also do with the contributions that I make because I believe about upliftment. I'm an ambassador for HBCU Week and I partnered with Ashley Christopher and Mayor Persicki in Delaware and others to generate over 10,000 scholarships in excess of over $65 million in scholarships for African-Americans. But this man will tell you I'm lying. He even went so far as to say my autobiography, where I talk about my mother, my father, my sisters, the business, my hiring and firing and rehiring at ESPN, I didn't write it. I didn't write my own memoir, which, by the way, is a New York Times bestseller, something he wouldn't know anything about. Did you know that it's now on paperback? It just came out yesterday on paperback. Did you know that you can go to Amazon.com, straightshooter.book.com, or a bookstore nearest you to get my book in paperback? Do you know that when people are normally selling 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 copies, I've sold over 400,000? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? But he will tell you, I didn't write it. He's seen my writing. Really? <sighs> this article is an article written on Deadspin.com. The title, How Jason Whitlock is Poisoning ESPN's Black Grantland. Because remember, Bill Simmons, who's now at Spotify doing a great job, obviously had Grantland at ESPN, and upon his departure, Jason Whitlock was supposed to take up the mantle and create a black website for folks. This article was written by a Greg Howard, published on April 27th, 2015. The same Jason Whitlock that said he's seen my writing, the same Jason Whitlock that implied that I couldn't write, the same Jason Whitlock that said that I'm lying, that I'm lying. What does this man do? Why would I call up this article? There's a plethora of reasons why I would do so, ladies and gentlemen. One of the reasons would be because it's as in-depth as it gets about how scurrilous, how trifling, how despicable this man is. But there's also another reason that I pick up this article. Let me read the graph to you that it says. Keep in mind, Stephen A. can't write. This staff, the one Whitlock was praising by way of warnings that if the writers and editors wouldn't align with his vision, he would get rid of them, was not the one Whitlock wanted. The Undefeated, because that was the name of the title before it ultimately became and Escape. The Undefeated was originally meant to attract the best and brightest young black talent in the country, with Whitlock's aim set so high that he at one point seriously tried to recruit the Atlantic's ta Coates, the sharpest cultural commentator in the business today. As things worked out, though, those young writers comprehensively refused to work with him. So did big-name ESPNers like Howard Bryant, Jamel Hill, and Stephen A. Smith. I couldn't write, huh? While you were on Blaze TV, spewing that bullshit to people, did you tell them that? Did you tell them how you stood outside, outside of first tape begging me to talk to you? Did you tell them that once the same article in Deadspin came out, weeks later you wrote a lengthy apology to me in an email begging me to forgive you, pointing out how you were betrayed by this particular writer so you know how I must feel that you betrayed me? Did you tell the folks that, you bitch? Did you tell them, you fat piece of shit? Did you tell them that? Got the names. We got Jamel Hill. We got Howard Bryant. You want me to bring up the other writers that wouldn't work for you? Why it took you nearly two years to get an article out? Because you ran that shit so bad you were running it into the ground? What a disgrace you were to John Skipper, the former boss of ESPN? Or the host of others? You want me to talk about that? Because I got receipts. I got the email. Want me to talk about that? Now, just for everybody that wants to understand, how could this possibly be? Because once upon a time, I actually tried to speak up for this damn cretin. I knew he was a piece of shit. All right, now y'all heard both sides. Y'all heard both sides. Now, tell me what y'all think. Tell me what y'all think. You know what I'm saying? Tell me what y'all think. I think both could be true. That would say, tell us how both could be true. Both could be true because Stephen A could be bending the truth a little bit. You know, a little bit. He bent the truth a little bit when it came to that basketball thing. And Jason Whitlock just hate. He hate. He is. He is. You know, he got, you know, he gonna have it. He got asked to ground ESP anyway. But I like Jason Whitlock. I follow Jason too. You know what I'm saying? I follow Jason too. I like both of these, both of these brothers right here. I like both of these brothers right here. I ain't gonna get on here and be on here like, uh, why we always gotta go against each other? No, no, there's enough of y'all gonna say that. But I'm gonna say, I agree with both of them. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But yeah, I agree with both of them. Steve, they lied a little bit. And uh, Jason would lie, he, 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 he's searching for something, he picking, he picking. 
Now he on point a little bit when he talk about the narrative and everything, because he been inside. He been a, a, a he been a reporter for a long, long time. So what he's saying, what, what he's saying, I'm not just going poop poop. But I want to hear what y'all got to say. Holla.